All right, today on Beers TV, it's the top 20 failures or mistakes that we've made with heaters over the years. You can learn from all of our mistakes. You don't have to repeat them. Increase your own success rates because we've messed it all up and we can show you how. All right, so starting with number one. And that's the mistake of missing that this little heater is the number one reason why you're going to leave the hobby if it fails. And on a long enough timeline, every piece of electronic on our tank is going to fail. So if your tank uh, crashes, it is the exit point for most people, or at yeah, least oh yeah. a break point, right? Oh yeah. And the number one cause of a tank crash is this piece right here. <laughs> and so you just need to understand that every single piece of electronics on the tank is going to fail at some point. Mm. Some of it, no big deal. You just catch it and replace it. Some of it, you have hours to catch it before it needs to, or before it'll have a devastating impact on the tank. Mm. The heater is definitely one of them. So you just need to know that this is the most likely piece of equipment on the entire tank to catastrophically fail. And then once you understand that, we can solve it with all the different solutions. All right, so number two, I've actually made this mistake for sure. Uh, once you learn it once, you should not learn it again. Yeah, and that mistake is putting the heater anywhere in the tank where it's gonna be exposed to air or has the potential to be exposed to air. So, I mean, you look at your tank and you look at the baffles in the sump, maybe even that overflow over the back of the tank, and you think, oh, I could probably put a heater there. It's hidden, it's out of the way. But then, you know, down the road, what you gotta think about is, if the tank drains or the sump drains to a certain point, or even if that overflow drains that you decide to put it in, uh, what happens to the heater when it's exposed to the open air and it's touching other surfaces? Yeah, so a couple of things. Don't usually install it in a vertical manner, mm. right? Because uh, often the water level will go too low during a water change or yeah. your auto top off fails or whatnot. Uh, but also a big one is one you already mentioned, which is in the return pump area. Yeah. So water evaporates pretty fast from that specific area in the sump. And so if you place it up too high, it could go below it. And then in your plastic sump, it will melt right through, which is a flood and fire hazard. So make sure when you're installing your heater to put it in a place in a tank where almost no matter what, it will always stay submerged. All right, so number three, most people don't even think about it. No, and I'm guilty of this one too. And that's making the mistake of uh, not having realistic expectations for my $35 heater. So, you know, it's one of those things that I bought, I put it in the tank, and I really didn't even think about it until, you know, oh, my, my, heat, my tank's not heating anymore. Something's mm -hmm. wrong. So that is probably the mistake in itself is that when you buy something, most people don't really think about when is it going to fail, Yeah, right? I didn't even have any expectation at all because <laughs> I didn't even give it any thought. So, you know, almost any $35 electronics in our life probably has a limited lifespan because mm. it's, you know, not the most advanced piece of equipment. In this case, we're actually relying on it for life support mm. for the pets and organisms that we care for. So put a little bit of thought into how long this thing can last. And there's a bunch of solutions out there that as long as we're thinking about it, mm. we can actually solve them as long as we have those realistic expectations. All right, so number four is actually really closely related to that. Yeah, and one I just hinted to made this mistake myself, and that is not replacing your heater until it's broken. And that's when you, you know, go down in the basement and reach your hand in the frag tank and it's ice cold. Thing could have been running for like two years and you had no idea, but it's time to replace it now. And now it might be too late. Yeah, so it's really hard to get into the mindset of taking something that looks like it's working mm. and throwing it in the trash, yep. <laughs> right? Here's the thing though, it's not a toaster and I'll wait till my toaster breaks and I will throw it away and go yep. get a new one. Yeah, uh, just when not have breaks. toast that day. This is an actual piece of light support for our pets and it will fail. We've already covered that it's the number one reason why you may fail and end up getting out of the hobby. Mm. And for 35 bucks, you can choose to just preempt that whole thing and throw it in the trash. They won't get you out of the whole thing, but if the average lifespan of this thing is two to three years, if I replace it every 18 months, I'm probably skipping 80% of the chance of the failure just by choosing to replace it before it fails. It's a piece of life support. You don't wait and just hope that you catch it. If your strategy is wait and hope you catch it in time, mm. the chances for success go way down. All right, so number five is probably the number one way that most advanced reefers handle heater failure mm. and certainly in uh, the whole scope of the way that I deal with it, but not always the right way. Yeah, and that mistake is assuming that technology costs far less than just replacing the heater or the technology itself. So, you know, I'm gonna buy a, a, a controller and I'm gonna monitor my heat and then I'll know the instant that my heater is broken and I can go do something about it. Uh, but, you know, implementing all of that actually end up costing longer in the, wrong, in the long run than just replacing it. 
Yeah, to some degree, it ends mm. up being, you know, I hired the cat to catch the mouse to catch the fly, right? <laughs> True. And so what happens is you have your heater controller here, mm. backed up by like your apex controller, yeah. you know, giving you audible alarms, maybe turning on or uh, off other, uh, you know, uh, fans or chillers or other heaters on and off, mm. you know, in series to try to catch the whole thing. And that will all work, except for the Apex also has a you know electronical thermostat in there. It also has uh, relays that open and close in some of the outlets. So like like using technology to capture or catch technology failures over and over again, yeah. uh, absolutely works. But also has flaws in it, and generally pretty expensive as well. Mm -hmm. So when you think about it, I would say you can use technology to cat uh, catch and avoid 90% of the failures out there with a, a controller, specifically one that will actually do something about it, right. but also one that will just let you know about it, like a monitor, uh, sends a, like a Senai sends you a, a, an alert to your phone yep. or email. But just simply taking the heater and throwing the trash every year will probably get you about 80% of the way, so not as good of an option, mm. but actually way cheaper. Okay, so that brings up number six. Yeah, and that is uh, making the mistake of only considering one of the three, and that's definable, usable lifespan, using controllers, using alarms. You know, all of these things can save your heater, save your tank. Uh, but if you're only considering one, your your chances of failure, you know, are a lot higher. Yeah, so regardless of what it is, decide what your usable lifespan for the heater is and mm. attempt to throw it out and replace it before it breaks. Use the redundancy to actually control it and turn it off if it ever gets too high. Mm -hmm. And then have those alarms, whether it be something like an email or text message or even just an audible alarm or something flashing in your room yeah. so you don't have to stick your hand in it to find out. If you do all three of those things together, you'll change this from the number one reason that you may exit the hobby to like less than 1% chance and almost completely eliminate it from your list of risks. And so number seven, this one actually caught me way off guard. Yeah, and the mistake is assuming that they're accurate out of the box. And this is something we had, took a couple BRS TV Investigates tests to discover where, okay, I open them, my brand new heater, I set it to 78 degrees, I drop it in my tank, should be 78 degrees. Well, there's like a handful of them, almost every single one of them are different, and some upwards of like five degrees. Yeah, so uh, you definitely need to calibrate them. Mm. And sometimes calibration, you can't actually calibrate the unit itself, but you can just know it's two degrees off. And then set, but yeah. I've seen them off by as much as six degrees. And even if you look at the window of accuracy on many of them, they even say one to two degrees. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of people don't read the fine details on a lot of these heaters. But again, they're only a $35 piece of equipment, and so the accuracy mm -hmm. within that, even if you buy a $35 just like thermometer, you're probably not gonna get better than a one degree accuracy in yeah. most cases. So just know what you're dealing with and make sure that you double check it, especially if it just feels off, because most people can actually get pretty close with just yeah. their finger. But even with the Apex, don't think that the Apex is out of the box going to be accurate or your controller because it might not be either. And you should check that against the thermometer. There's a couple of ways to do that. We sell some NIST validated ones on the website, mm -hmm. but you can also use virtually any thermometer that you have and just use three of them and average them to get something very close. All right, so number eight, don't ever do this not for a single day. Yeah, and that mistake is plugging your heating element directly into your aquarium controller outlet and then expecting it to you know, control your on and off cycles of your heater. It's just not worth the stress and wear and tear on this $300 EB832. Yeah, and it can fail too. So uh, it's just a thermostat. It may seem like it's better because it costs a lot more money, mm. but there's a lot of things that went into it, not just the thermostat. But any piece of electronic can fail, especially the things that are turning on and off as yep. many times as that. So it may seem like uh, that they sell these heaters that don't have a controller on them and just a plug, maybe to save money so you can use your aquarium controller, but that is not the case. The reason that they're separate is so that you can replace just your little temperature controller alone rather than the heating element as well, especially if you're gonna buy something really nice and the heating element will probably last a really long time. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that case, you just wanna make sure that you never, ever, ever, ever plug only the heating element into your apex because the whole purpose of this is to have redundancy. So the apex not controlling the temperature, but catching it whenever this one fails. All right, so number nine, heavily debated item but there is a right and wrong answer. Yeah, and the mistake on this one is using your aquarium controller or your Apex 
to regulate the temperature or for the temperature control for your aquarium, in which case, uh, if you're asking yourself, okay, so do I set my apex so that it, mon it keeps the tank at 78 degrees, or do I set my heater controller so that it keeps 78 degrees and then use my apex as the backup? The second choice is the right choice. This is why. Uh, basically, this is a pretty inexpensive item, yeah. uh, the $35 heater. And so I'm going to wear one of these out much faster than the other mm -hmm. one. So if I set this one off, it's going to turn on and off hundreds of thousands to millions of times a year. And then when it wears out, I'll just throw it away. However, if I choose to use the apex as what is controlling the heater, mm -hmm. and then you set this a couple degrees higher as the backup, what I'm going to wear out is the outlets on the EB-8, which cost 300 bucks. So if I'm going to wear something out, I'd much rather wear out the much less expensive uh, heater controller mm -hmm. and then use the Apex outlet and Apex head unit as the backup. All right, so number 10, you've actually seen me publicly fail on this because uh, I've actually done it wrong in the past, and my opinion on this has largely evolved. Yeah, and the mistake was make, not making an informed decision on your temperature swings and the on and off cycles of your heater. I mean, you had given the advice early on years ago where, you know, the tightest, most stable, you know, temperature that you can possibly get. So 78 is your set point, only allow it to go 78.1 or 77.9. But really what that does is just increase how many times this thing's turning off and on and off and on and off and on, which increases the likelihood of failure over time. Yeah, so especially with anything with a moving part in it, turning it on and on and off millions of times obviously is going to wear it out. But even any electronics, mm. the powering up and powering down phase is where things wear out. So really put a, like informed thought into this one. And at this point, I know stability is king, and this is why I was really at that like 0.1 degree swing. Yeah. But stability also means being able to depend on the equipment in the tank. And so if you can change it to as much as three tenths or even half a degree, mm. it will drastically reduce the cycles of on off cycles and then increase the longevity, making it so you can trust your heater more. All right, so number 11, a little bit optional, but I actually think has a lot of value. Yeah, and the mistake here is not considering two temperature probes, put one in your display and one in the sump. And even though it's one connected body of water, should those bodies of waters become disconnected, I can tell because my temperature in the display might be colder, but my heater's in the sump and it just might be maintaining 78 degrees. So here's the thing. Uh, you almost always end up with the temp probe in your sump. The reality is, is I don't care what the temp is in the sump, <laughs> other than the fact it's a general representation of what the tank is. Right. So I'd actually like to measure it in the tank the most so that I can have an actual representation of where all the livestock is. Mm. If I have it both, I can then also set up alarms to tell me when it's disconnected and something's happening where the tank is on temperature and the sump isn't. All right, so number 12 is actually something that you may not even know you have a problem with, but actually is pretty bad. Yeah, and that is making the mistake of not considering the power output or the power draw from your heaters, in which case, you know, if it takes two 600 watt heaters to heat my tank, it's 1200 watts of potential, you know, wattage draw here. That's more than anything else in my tank in most cases. And I have to now be considerate of, are my power bars, are my energy bars, are my outlets in my home capable of handling that kind of load? Yeah, so in many cases, you may not even need 1,200 watts of heaters. You just need six, yeah. but you took a path of redundancy, so they both turn on. Uh, so there's another discussion related to that, yeah. but that actually eats up almost the entire wattage draw of a 15 amp circuit. You're riding the edge already. Mm. So do some thought into the total amount of wattage that you're gonna pull out of that single circuit in your house, because even if it hasn't flipped yet, you might be riding the edge or even over it. And what you're risking is at any moment, the uh, breaker box could flip and then you lose power or life support to the entire tank. So just go add it all up and make sure you're making an informed decision. All right, so number 13, there isn't a complete recommendation of what kind of heater you get. You really gotta put a little bit of thought into it. Yeah, and uh, for us here in Minnesota with basements, this one hits home and that's making the mistake of not thinking that Colder rooms require higher power heaters. So you might go over to the you know, product description or you might look at the box and it says, you know, I need 100 watt for this many gallons. And, but depending on where you have your tank located, is it in a basement? Do you run your AC you know, down to like 65, 70 degrees? That's gonna change you know, what you need for a heater. 
Yeah, so on the top floors of my house, actually the middle floor is 70 degrees. The top floor is generally like 72. And the bottom floor in the basement where the tank is is actually 65. Mm. And so the amount of energy required to heat that tank properly will be drastically different. So if you know that your tank is going to be in a cold area, make sure that you're buying enough heater to uh, compensate for that. All right, so number 14, almost the exact same thing. And that's not considering that tanks with higher evaporation also require higher power heaters, in which case like evaporation is cooling, active cooling of the tank, which means no, my heaters work harder. Yeah, so those who don't know, evaporation is actually a release of energy, mm. right? And so when we release that energy, uh, it actually requires more energy to heat it back up. So if you know that you're going to promote a lot of evaporation in your tank, you should also size your heaters up as well. All right, so number 15 is actually that question we asked earlier is, should you have redundant full-powered heaters mm. or should I have two half-powered heaters that make up one? And the fail here is really misunderstanding that there is a different solution for different cases and there's not always the right answer. Yeah, so in those colder environments, you know, where I'd ha need all of the wattage I can get from my heater to keep the tank warm, you know, best to have two full power heaters. Now we're talking, if a, if a 600 watt heater gets the job done for redundancy, two 600 watt heaters. In case one fails, I have one that can maintain the temperature I'm targeting. Yeah, it's really thinking about like, what's the temperature of the room, yeah. right? So if the temperature of the room is generally 60 degrees, the risk now is mm -hmm. that the kink is gonna get too cold if the power of the heaters fail. Right. And so it's managing risk. However, if it's in a room where its average temperature is 70 to 72, if one of the heaters fails, really not as big of a deal. Mm -hmm. So if you have a cold room, you really, really probably should think about getting two heaters that are full size and then managing to that. Number 16, the opposite of that. Yeah, and that is the warmer environment. So now we have an ambient room temperature that's kind of close to my tank or not as cold, in which case I probably don't need as much heater to, to maintain it. So I can use both heaters to maintain my target temperature. And if one fails, maybe at least 60% of that leftover heater keeps my tank up there. Yeah, if you're looking for 78 degrees and it requires, uh, you know, 300 watts of heat to get there, well, I could do 300 watt one heater, or I could do two like 200 watt heaters, yeah. or even maybe even two 150 watt heaters and get me there. And then if one of those fails, I'm probably not gonna drop all the way down to the 70 degrees of the ambient room. I'll probably drop to like, you know, 75, right. split the middle. And that really isn't that dangerous for the tank. So think about the application here and then apply it to your tank. So number 17, our actual real recommendation on all this, because you're probably not going to do all that math. Yeah, and that is, you know, just going with the redundant 70% of heaters. So like you said, if a 300 watt heater gets the job done, then split it between two 200 watt heaters. And now I have 200 watts that if one fails, I'm 70% of the way to my target temp. Yeah, so if you're looking for a rule of thumb, I'd say about 70% uh, with one heater mm. and then double it for redundancy. When one fails, it'll keep the tank warm. Maybe not all the way there, but it'll be really close. All right, so number 18, almost nobody thinks about this. Yeah, and that goes back to just what we were saying is, you know, monitoring your temperature in your ambient room. And the easy way to do this is add another temperature probe and just leave it out now out in the living room. Yeah, so most people don't think about this. They yeah. think of the aquarium heater as what's heating the tank but it's really the room temperature. Yeah, for sure. So it's your furnace and your air conditioner that's actually heating and cooling the tank mm -hmm. for the most part. This is really just kind of fine tuning an accessory, it. Accessory, yeah. Yeah, so putting an ambient uh, uh, temperature probe in the room can tell you all kinds of things. And most of it will be when your family mess things up for you. <laughs> uh, so somebody decided to open up a window mm -hmm. and turn off the air conditioning on a 90 degree day. Yep. Somebody, or the furnace fails, the air conditioner fails. All kinds of different things that will definitely happen on a long enough timeline. And then you'll know the moment it happened because the ambient room temperature will be 90 degrees or it will be uh, 40 <laughs> degrees, in which case you can actually go do something before it even starts to affect the tank. So if you have a few extra bucks or even just an extra port for it, go ahead and plug mm -hmm. in a temperature probe and monitor the ambient room temperature because it'll tell you all kinds of data about the environment that the tank's actually in. All right, so number 19, I've uh, actually failed in this because I just uh, don't pay attention to the details sometimes. Yeah, and that is making the mistake of not considering the length of the heating element. I mean, there's some that are larger than our sump put together. And you know, going back to some of our previous mistakes at keeping this thing submerged at all costs, the length of the heating element really comes into play. 
Yeah, so if you bought this 300 watt Eheim heater, uh, you can see that it's really, really long. So make sure that you go into the uh, like just product description and read the dimensions of it, make sure it fits. Yep. And the problem will be that you'll order it and you want the 300 watt and doesn't fit in the, there's no chamber that holds this. So you end up doing this and yeah. then violating one of the previous <laughs> rules, which is now it's not gonna be submerged yeah. if uh, uh, return pump fails or anything else. So making sure that you have have room to fit it in your sump. So when you're picking a heater, make sure that it can fit inside of the sump. Pay attention to the dimensions. All right, so number 20 actually can be solved with just a couple bucks and maybe one of the most important things we talked about today. Yeah, and the mistake is not having some sort of visual alarm or maybe even audible alarm. So if your temperature is off, like many times you, I've walked by my tank before and everything looks good. And that's temperature is something that I can't visually see unless it's catastrophic on one end or the other. Mm -hmm. In which case, if I walk by and I have even one of those color changing strips like you see in the freshwater tanks or something like that, that tells me my tank temperature is on point or high or low, then I can do something about it sooner. Yeah, accuracy isn't the most important thing yeah. here either. It's just knowing the change. So mm -hmm. if you got those little stickers that you pile on there, put it somewhere in the back. And even if it's not exactly what you think it is, it should be stable at that temperature. And if you ever walk up and see that it's not, you now know you should do something about mm -hmm. it. And often you'll have a lot of time before I actually see you know, negative effects in the tank, especially if it's going cold, like your heater failed. Right. Uh, but you also have the Senai and the Apex and even uh, the audible alarms from uh, just a heater controller mm -hmm. that flashes at you. So yeah. pick one of those solutions so you know it actually happened. So if you only heard one thing today, let it be this. This heater has a finite lifespan. Decide for yourself what it is and just replace it before it breaks mm. because the path of waiting till it breaks and just hoping that you're around to catch it is really, really low success rates. Mm. And even those using all that technology to try to catch it is only incrementally better. Putting that all together is actually the best path. So the biggest takeaway for me is making that mistake of assuming that out of the box my heater is accurate because most times it's not or it's pretty far off. In which case, do yourself a favor, grab a few thermometers or a NIST you know, thermometer and just go ahead and check the temperature out of the box. You'll probably have to adjust for it up or down a little bit, but doing so will make sure that you actually hit the target that you're expecting. And if you want to see our results and all the heaters that we tested, we have two BRSCV investigates on this subject. The latest one you can find right over here.